Hello and welcome to the program. My name is Luke Hunt and this is another podcast for The Diplomat. With me today in Colombo, near the backyard of his house, is Ganeshan Vignaraja. Now, Ganeshan is a Senior Research Associate at ODI Global in London and a Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. Ganeshan, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Now, obviously we're both in Sri Lanka and it's been an extraordinary two weeks. We've seen the toppling of a president, a prime minister who resigned, came back and is vowing to leave again. It's really all about the economics. And Sri Lankan economics is in a very bad way. It's got one hell of a debt and it's struggling to make ends meet and people are really doing it very hard. Can you take us through the numbers, please? Sure, look, this is quite a fall from grace for a country that was once considered a basic need success story as late as the 1960s and also seen really as, uh, you know, a country that could emulate the East Asian tiger economies after opening up in 1977 to foreign trade and investment. And today it's a debt defaulter. And the debt numbers are quite high. Uh, Sri Lanka's foreign debt is at least $51 billion, according to official figures. Um, That's the external debt. And some estimates suggest actually that number is closer to $60 billion. Right. And um, what this story of debt defaulting has meant is really a, a misery for the population of Sri Lanka. We have three quarters of a million new poor that have been created, partly linked to COVID, but also the debt crisis and the fallout. The growth pattern has collapsed. We will expect negative growth of minus 4 to minus 6% in 2022. And that has come with inflation of 50 to 70% this year. And so we have this phenomenon known as stagflation. And what all of this means for the ordinary person is three mile long petrol queues outside the front door of this house and three nights in a car to get any gasoline. Uh, It means families are having to skimp on their budgets and are going down to one meal a day and children are being malnourished because the diet is also switching to less nutritious food. So it's really quite a humanitarian disaster that we're beginning to see in Sri Lanka and a massive fall from grace for this country that had once aspirations to copy the East Asian tiger economies. It is extraordinary. I've seen the queues, I've seen the protests. I've been inside the presidential palace and taken a look at people taking a swim in his swimming pool. (laughs) It's uh, extraordinary scenes and I I feel one's heart has to go out for the youth of Sri Lanka in terms of what is their future and where they will go next. And I suspect the only answer to that, in my mind, is the International Monetary Fund. It would be the only institution on the planet capable of coming up with some kind of bailout package that this country requires. What what do you think needs to be done next? So just on the issue of the youth of this country, um, they face a really stark choice in this scenario. Their hopes and dreams are being eroded. Um, And, uh, you know, they're doing one of two things. Uh, One is that they are protesting on the street um, and the kinds of people that you have seen Uh, at Call Face Green in the Go Home, Gotha campaign and so on. Uh, And the other group are really walking with their feet. Uh, The passport office, uh, they said in this year, the six months to this year, they've processed 430,000 passport applications, uh, which is a good uh, 4 to 5 percent of our population. Uh, Quite extraordinary. It is an extraordinary number, yes. It's an extraordinary number. The International Monetary Fund really Uh, is the only solution for Sri Lanka at this stage of the crisis. The IMF was set up to deal with balance of payments difficulties in the developing and developed world, and Sri Lanka has been to the IMF 16 times, so this will be the 17th time they're going to it. The reason it becomes important is that they give you some money. We're hoping they'll give us three to four billion dollars worth of an IMF program. More importantly, uh, they provide a return to confidence in the economy because the IMF program involves inevitably uh, is economic austerity policies such as raising taxes, such as making utility prices more realistic, such as raising interest rates to control inflation, and also looking at state-owned enterprises which have been loss-making. But the 
upside of such program, particularly in the Sri Lankan case, is that they will also attempt to preserve expenditure, particularly social expenditure on food and on welfare measures to, so that the impact doesn't fall on the poorest of society. Right. Um, so the IMF program is really an essential part. It's one important component of a program, but there are others as well. I would also imagine it's about trust in that there have been a lot of charges levelled at uh, the government of, uh, of the Rajapaksa brothers and Gotabaya, who has just resigned. But it, it is a matter of trust between the people and the politicians, and that's obviously at a very low level, and I would imagine that the people might trust the IMF to spend the money wisely and properly where it's needed to be spent in terms of a, if a bailout package was to be forthcoming. So the IMF program essentially uh, will provide some money for restructuring. Um, they will, you know, insist on better tax administration in Sri Lanka, and some mm -hmm. expenditure will be on that. Uh, they will look at controlling expenditure. Uh, you know, we have uh, a lot of unnecessary, unproductive expenditure in loss-making state-owned enterprises, which probably should be looked at very carefully and either commercialized or certainly some due to privatization um, down the line. That would include the National Airline, uh, which is a candidate for that. That would include the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation, which has right. been another candidate that has, I think, debts of a billion dollars on its books. Uh, that would include the uh, Electricity uh, Board and other parastatals of that nature. The IMF program has scrutiny of, of a country once you're in a package that you will fulfill the conditionality that comes with such a program. And it gives confidence to other donors to also uh, step in, and I think that's the important uh, point. Uh, we hope that the IMF program will bring with it World Bank assistance uh, and Asian Development Bank assistance, for instance. And uh, with that, they might fund a conditional cash transfer program uh, for the poorest who are suffering. Those three quarter of a million people I talked about, for instance, uh, becomes very important. Two conditions for any aid, which I feel uh, is very, very necessary to ensure aid is properly effective in Sri Lanka. One is this aid should be island-wide. It should be given in the north and east of the country. It should be given to the central part of the country around Kandy. It should be given to the deep south. So they shouldn't just try to put it in Colombo and Gampa, which is where we are at the present. It right. has been the traditional pattern. Uh, the second very important uh, thing is that this aid should be free of corruption and there should be very little leakage. Historically, Sri Lanka has not had the best record of uh, use of foreign aid. There have been leakages and, uh, you know, very careful monitoring of every dollar has to be there and the government must be completely accountable um, so such practices are stopped in their tracks completely. Would the IMF be capable of launching some type of independent investigation into what has happened to the money of Sri Lanka, given that, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, the external debt is at $51 billion. There's been a lot of accusations made uh, against the Rajapaksa family. Where could the IMF take Sri Lanka from a legal perspective? So the IMF typically doesn't help you with uh, asset recovery in that sense. Uh -huh. um, the IMF you know, tries to clear up your macroeconomy and achieve financial and debt sustainability, if you like, in your economy, right? The asset recovery really uh, is a legal process. Um, and if we take the example of the Philippines, where you usually get a law firm um, and the government working together to try to recover assets that are stolen. And uh, that involves, you know, a lot of years of investigation in the case of the Philippines, from what I understand. And it still hasn't gone anywhere. It still hasn't and gone. You're obviously referring to uh, the Marcoses and uh, the son is back in power. That's right. So, I mean, in, I think in the Philippine case, they did recover some amount of the money, I believe, that was uh, stolen. Yep. Um, I, I believe the figure is some $3 billion. Um, yes, the cycle in the Philippines has uh, changed uh, a lot. And you have uh, from Ferdinand Marcos, who was deposed um, and sought exile in the United States and died there. Now his son, uh, Bong Bong Marcos, uh, who has come in, Ferdinand Jr., they call him sometimes. And he has just been elected by a massive landslide. And um, from what I understand from the Filipinos, you know, there's a new generation in power. Marcos's were 30 odd years ago, 30, 40 years ago. So this younger yep. generation don't remember it. They had a very, very clever social media campaign to market, uh, you know, Ferdinand Marcos's achievements. Um, and there was some disillusionment with the Democrats who uh, came after Marcos 
uh, in terms of their ability to change the country and provide uh, for the basic needs of the poor Filipinos. And uh, again, like this country of Sri Lanka, the Filipinos are, have been voting traditionally with their feet. It's one of the countries which has one of the largest overseas populations. In the, in one of the largest voting. remittances. Exactly, um, exactly, which, is, which has also been very uh, key. Um, so the asset recovery process is a long and complex one and uh, may yield mixed results, shall we say, but this is not something the IMF does as far as I understand the process. Right. And the latest uh, came from a cabinet spokesman yesterday saying that uh, there was $2 billion had been found in bank accounts in Dubai and perhaps another $10 billion in uh, unrecovered assets that they might go searching for. Are those numbers uh, extreme? I've seen a lot of figures bandied about and some of them seem a little bit high. It's very hard, you know, to, to put a number on recoverable assets, shall we say, in this manner, um, mainly because we really don't know what the data is. You know? and yeah. If we take the Philippine case and there are similar cases elsewhere, um, you know, it just becomes very, very hard because usually in these cases people are very good at hiding money um, and they usually use front people mm -hmm. um, who are hard to find and they use bogus bank accounts and so on and, and I suspect, you know, the trail in such cases can be, you know, global and it's very, very hard. Uh, to put a number on it or to say what there is, but you know, hopefully some history will in the future tell uh, what the story has been. And right. um, I, I don't hold my breath, to be honest, if we take the historical example of asset recovery worldwide. You know, um, and and so you know, it's it's something I think a, a state may wish to pursue, um, particularly when there is the situation of a defaulting country like Sri Lanka. But I, I'm not sure of what the chances are uh, in terms of achieving successes. There's also um, some mild differences between corruption and gross mismanagement, and people who have followed Sri Lanka, also Lao, they've been quick to point the finger at China. Now, in, in Sri Lanka, the, the top lender is Japan. As I understand it, number two is the Asian Development Bank, and then comes China with about 10% of the debt. How do you think the Chinese will respond to a IMF bailout? So the Chinese have, uh, I think, most recently welcomed um, an IMF program for Sri Lanka because they want to try to get some of their uh, debt uh, you know, paid off in the future. Mm -hmm. um, the, just the backstory on China and on Sri Lanka trying yep. to seek uh, help from China uh, for its debt issue uh, was kind of partly dating to January this year when the Chinese foreign minister came to Sri Lanka and uh, he, uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa, made a formal request that China will provide us with some sort of moratoria on debt for some period and also provide us with a billion dollars worth of export credit so we could import oil and food and things of that nature. The Chinese had been very ambivalent about this and I think they face a real dilemma in providing Sri Lanka with such kinds of relief. Um, and the dilemma comes like this. They uh, like uh, being able to have this deep friendship with Sri Lanka, which is historic and dates back to the time when uh, China you know, joined the United Nations um, and we had the rubber ice back in the 1950s. The hotel. That's right. That's right. But at the same time, um, China you know, is uh, wary of uh, giving Sri Lanka a bailout of its uh, debt because uh, Sri Lanka... Uh, may be joined by a queue of other countries that have similarly failed it, it Belt and Road projects. And uh, there could be Laos, there could be Ghana, there could be Ethiopia, uh, there could be countries in Central America. I mean, China is worried about opening up the floodgates. Um, and then there's the other argument that China, you know, sees itself as a G2 country challenging the United States for global supremacy. And why would it want its brand of infrastructure-led growth model be hitched to a wagon such as a founding economy like Sri Lanka's. There's also the old traditional arguments about Sri Lanka and it goes to deep sea ports, Trincomalee, which is extraordinarily, it's an extraordinary port where when you get up there and you see those things. You know, obviously the Chinese would have liked to have had greater access to, these, to this part of the world for its own strategic Yes, I mean, there's the geopolitical uh, reasoning. Um, in uh, the Belt and Road projects in Sri Lanka, um, th th there have been many, and Sri Lanka was quite cautious to try to ensure that China didn't bring its <coughs> military along with the Belt and Road so that we mm -hmm. have a Dubuti-type scenario. 
Um, and then there was an incident I remember during the time of Mahindra Rajapaksa in 2014 when uh, two Chinese submarines came uh, to Sri Lanka. Right. And that raised the hackles of the Indians who then um, you know, launched a very strong protest and we haven't seen Chinese submarines on the surface here after that. And the Hamman Toto port um, deal which was struck in 2019 by a previous administration, uh, Sirisena Vikramasinghe administration, uh, where they gave Hamman Toto port on a lease uh, to China one point uh, something billion dollars, um, that had clauses ex explicitly built in that Sri Lanka would be responsible for port security to avoid precisely this kind of security dilemma. But sadly, Sri Lanka has become, you know, the playing field of the great powers and great power rivalries are being played out here. And China, uh, you know, very much wanted to sort of uh, challenge India for its sphere of influence. Sure. Short isn't that, isn't that of one of Sri Lanka's assets, its strategic position? Yes, so Sri Lanka is very strategically located in the Indian Ocean, a few miles off the southern coast of India, and close to the sea lane, the main east-west sea yep. lane that goes between Europe and Asia, uh, and is quite a strategic uh, vantage point. The other interesting point about Sri Lanka's location is that about three quarters of our trade, I think, uh, comes in here, uh, is really destined for Indian ports, because, uh, because of the port mm -hmm. strait, the big ships uh, have to... Uh, come to Sri Lanka, unload their goods, get put onto smaller ships, the cargoes, and get sent off to India on smaller ships. India does not have uh, deep uh, port capacity from what I understand. And Colombo Port is uh, one of the world's best ports. I think on the Lloyd's list it's the 24th best port right. in the world for container traffic. And so as a result of this, um, and the perception that, you know, uh, a Sri Lankan economy uh, that's vibrant could be kind of a gateway to the Indian subcontinent, uh, kind of a Hong Kong to China yep. kind of example. Uh, so there are many reasons why China and India or even the United States uh, is interested in Sri Lanka due to its geographical location. Do you, the, the whole concept of Chinese debt traps, is that fair or has there been a little bit too much mudslinging over so, the last few years? So, I mean, this has been put out there um, as a very strong narrative uh, it comes, I think, from a study by an Indian scholar uh, in a Delhi think tank and then picked up by the media, particularly the New York Times. But when you start looking at the evidence, and I did a study with a couple of uh, colleagues from Shman Kabir Gam Institute, where I was the director, uh, on the Belton Road and uh, Sri Lanka, and we did this for Chatham House. And what we found was that um, the Chinese debt na trap narrative was a bit overstated, but there was the risk of a debt trap if Sri Lanka continued to borrow heavily from China at commercial interest rates. Mm -hmm. And the numbers today, I, I did some work recently for a, a, a paper, and um, the numbers are that China, of the 50-odd billion dollars uh, of Sri Lanka's external debt, China accounts for some $7.6 billion uh, of that debt. Right. And uh, quite a bit of that is, of course, the Exim Bank of China. Um, and China is, uh, by the way, not the largest holder of our debt. Uh, half of that 50-odd billion is private capital markets. And uh, Japan uh, is also very large bilateral. And then the multilaterals are the ADB and the World Bank. So, so China is significant. So we're not quite in a Chinese debt trap in that uh, very measurable sense. But certainly the numbers have been creeping up. The uh, debt number in 2013, if my memory serves me right, was only uh, $2.7 billion. So the, the debt over to China has creeped up. Now, there are suggestions that that debt number is understated because uh, official Sri Lankan stats, um, anything that you can get, does not count in uh, debt uh, owed to China held by state-owned enterprises. The debt trap theory doesn't quite hold, but it's a clear warning for developing countries like Sri Lanka that if you take on uh, you know, infrastructure projects from China, you better make sure there is proper infrastructure master planning mm -hmm. uh, that is adhered to, that you do proper cash benefit analysis to global standards, and that when you build these roads, for instance, you ensure the traffic flows are there. Uh, we have this beautiful highway that goes from Colombo to Hambantota, which is called the Southern Expressway, and believe me, it's a joy to drive on because there are very few cars on it. In the middle of a petrol crisis, there are no cars on it. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a wonderful example uh, of a highway that goes to nowhere. But at the same time, you, you could say that if we had used that money to build a highway connecting the central part of the country, or indeed the north and the east of the country with Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. and opened up to India in the north, uh, you would have had much more traffic flow. So it's about opportunity cost, right, and how we use the money. 
Right. But basically, you know, the, the Southern Expressway, uh, like some of the other Chinese projects, the rates of return are fairly uh, low, and uh, you know, but the costs were quite high, and would take years to have any kind of cost recovery. The politics has been a mess. Every day, the scenarios seem to change and just results in more confusion. However, it does seem that an all-party government will be formed. Uh, have you got any ideas how an APG, which I think that's what they're calling it, uh, what, what sort of shape and form that will take? So Sri Lanka's parliamentary democracy has been a very messy one indeed. Um, and I think the latest events are very interesting because you've kind of had mass protests leading to the departure of a president. Yep. And I think this is the first time in our history where we've had this phenomenon. But our democracy is alive and well. Uh, in, in, in some sense. The issues on the 20th are really to try to get a, a, a new president in power elected by parliament and uh, there are different uh, versions of what's floating around. There are various names that are uh, being uh, mentioned. Uh, one prominent candidate is Sajid Premadasa, the leader of the SBJ party, which is the opposition in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's being mentioned. Uh, he is the son of a former president, uh, but has been in opposition for some time, um, and uh, seems to be making a very passionate case for a well-run economy, um, and he thinks that he has a plan, uh, which we will expect details on quite soon, to try to relieve us of this uh, debt problem, right. uh, which will, I'm sure, involve the IMF, because they've been kind of talking about that, but also it'll be interesting to see what other kinds of reforms are there. Um, the other candidate that's being mentioned is somebody called Dallas Aluperuma. Uh, he is a party stalwart of the Gotabe Rajapaksi party, which is the SLPP. Um, and he's seen as a kind of a moderate and non-family member, which would be a big plus, and a conciliator. So he would be another person in that uh, leadership uh, contest. And then there are other characters, uh, fringe characters. Uh, there is uh, also um, uh, the, the current uh, acting president, Ranil Vikramasinghe, who uh, has expressed some interest, we hear from he's behind the not, scenes. He's it fits in a very odd way, though, because uh, he was in opposition against the Rajapaksas. Then he's brought in as a Prime Minister who doesn't really represent anyone in Parliament. The protests seem to ease a little bit. He makes a comeback. The, back, the protests are back on. We don't want him. And they burnt his house down. <laughs> you know... Uh, difficult character to figure out where does he fit in this equation or does, does he or does he not fit into a future equation um, uh, for Sri Lanka? I, I, I think, you know, there are mixed views about Ranil Vikramasinghe in Sri Lanka. Um, on the one front, you know, he has been Prime Minister five times before and this is his sixth time. Mm -hmm. So he's hugely experienced and he is one of the very few politicians in Sri Lanka who really understands foreign policy or indeed uh, the economy. Um, and, uh, you know, that is to his great strength. Right. Um, his gap people have talked about in his, uh, is really implementing policies. That has been one of the issues uh, that they talk about. Um, when we look at this particular incarnation of him, um, his party had been wiped out of the last election. He came in indeed through what's called the National List um, in Sri Lanka. And um, he, he came in at a time when the Sri Lankan governance and uh, polity were floundering and he is said to have provided a measure of stability uh, initially, uh, which I think was very important. And his two big achievements in this round, the way I see it, is that he got uh, the, the law firm and the debt advisor, Clifford Chance as well as Lazard, actually appointed. And I think that was a very important uh, fact for Sri Lanka because without this we can't get an IMF program. We have to show debt sustainability. And this law firm and uh, debt advisor um, will not only produce a report that's important for the IMF, but will also conduct negotiations with China and other tricky characters. And that's essential. Without that, we can't go for an IMF program. Right. The second big achievement was that he got the IMF team to actually come to the country physically to discuss the staff level agreement. Uh, now, neither of these two things were being uh, discussed or happening under the Rajapaksa administration. Um, and uh, so those were two very big achievements, and he provided also uh, a lot of confidence with uh, bilateral uh, uh, aid providers. So mm -hmm. India had provided over the course of this year, including the period when Ranil Vikram Singh has been Prime Minister, $3.4 billion of aid. 
um, and the United States has provided, I think, another $150 million, primarily for helping small and medium enterprise, but also some emergency food aid and also something for the dairy industry, if my memory serves me right. Um, where probably uh, the protesters uh, have been ambivalent, and I think that's due to two groups of protesters. There, there's one group of the original uh, peaceful protesters, the so-called Aragalia uh, people's protest, who are basically ordinary folk who are really hurting badly from this crisis. Um, and they probably have mixed feelings about running Vikramasinghe. Uh, happy that he came and steadied the ship, but are ambivalent about him being, you know, a long-term leader. And then there is a extremist element uh, who have come in with this group, and I think, you know, have been behind a lot of this uh, uh, difficult violence we've seen on some of the government right. buildings recently, yeah. because this movement suddenly changed, right, from a very peaceful movement to something quite violent, if you like. Which I might add, I've seen in protests across. Southeastern, Southern Asia, uh, Malaysia, Cambodia, Thailand, Hong Kong, uh, all these protests have had those issues. That's right. So, so I think, uh, you know, there's some mixed views, but I think, uh, you know, at the end of the day, when Sri Lankans really look back at history, mm. uh, they might see a bit more favourably of Ranil Vikramasinghe, um, you know, coming into this uh, storyline. Um, and uh, he also um, should be credited with stabilizing the government, I think, when uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa fled the country. I mean, he has provided some stability and, uh, you know, when the law and order situation was at risk and parliament was about to also be uh, um, stormed by the protesters, he, um, you know, provided for the army to come in and I think had provided some element of law and order. So, you know, the existential threat to the Sri Lankan state was there and I think, you know, as a five-time prime minister, he six-time Prime Minister, mm -hmm. he, he recognized that. So I think, you know, one hopes that, you know, history will give him uh, a kind pass for, you know, coming in at the crucial points. Um, uh, now, against this is that some suggest that he bailed out the Rajapaksas by coming in and so on and enabled Gotha to flee as well as, you know, may have given a pass to them earlier. But we'll have to wait and see. But I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag um, as to where I see it. I, I, on a further note regards the IMF, the negotiations between Gotabaya and uh, Vladimir Putin to acquire Russian oil, it seems a little bit odd that one would go to the IMF and ask for a bailout, the IMF essentially being an American institution historically and it's controlled by the Europeans and the Japanese, but to go to the IMF and uh, to ask for money while at the same time negotiating with Vladimir Putin to acquire Russian oil, which is under sanctioned, is that? Do you find that strange? Well, Sri Lanka is in a desperate state as far as fuel is concerned. And, you know, there are these three mile long queues outside uh, where yeah, we're speaking, sure. and people have been sleeping in their cars for three days. And this is a major source of frustration amongst the people, but also a major problem for Sri Lanka because, you know, we depend on diesel and petrol really to move goods around and food in particular from the agricultural heartlands to the city. Mm -hmm. uh, Colombo. And so, you know, the country is uh, facing a food crisis and, uh, you know, they're desperate. So that uh, mark of going to Russia and asking for oil um, is uh, similar to that. Now, the other aspect of that is really this sort of non-aligned, more non-aligned approach that Gotabe brought in uh, compared to his brother Mahinda, who was very pro-Chinese. Right. Um, and so, you know, under such a non-aligned regime, you try to deal with anybody who will help you particularly those in difficult times. Um, and it was unclear, you know, how uh, the Russian uh, oil deal, if it were with Sri Lanka, was going to go and what effect it would have on things like sanctions and so on. It's very unclear. Uh, the IMF, you know, is a multilateral organization, so certainly the United States has uh, a lot of uh, influence in the institution. Uh, but to my knowledge, IMF programs have been usually rolled out uh, for countries in this kind of difficulty, uh, providing their sole show debt sustainability. Um, so one hopes that that same view would apply here. How do you think Sri Lanka will shape up two, three, four, five years from now? So I'm reasonably optimistic that Sri Lanka can come out of this current debt and economic crisis if it does three things. One, it actually gets this IMF program and implements it properly. Uh, second, if it 
puts in to place economic reforms to make the economy more open to foreign trade and investment, uh, cut red tape and become more market oriented in the way that the East Asian tiger economies did. And that's a longer term process and implementing some of the reforms is very difficult. And a look East policy should come as part of that if we are going to try to um, prosper. A third element really is political reform. And the political reform is going to be a tricky one. Uh, one angle of that is abolishing this executive presidency, which has been a bane on uh, this country. We have concentrated power in the hands of one or two individuals over time. And these individuals sadly have not uh, lived up to the litmus test of being uh, good leaders as well as uh, clean leaders. Uh, and, and that's been a, a real problem. Uh, and Gotabe Rajapaksa uh, sort of symbolizes some of that. Um, Another important political reform we've got to have um, is really moving towards a Westminster-style parliamentary system, which is what uh, getting rid of the executive presidency would imply. And um, you know, it would also mean, I guess, uh, more activism in the Commonwealth. And there would be a question of who would be head of state. Would it be the uh, King of England or the Queen of England? Yep. Or would it be uh, some other uh, party, or sort of an Indian-style president without any real powers, uh, as we uh, might have in Sri Lanka? in the future. Then there is the vexed issue of having a uh, anti-corruption process and policy. And that requires asset declarations by all parliamentarians and people who want to run for office. And those need to be verified. We need a very strong anti-corruption office, uh, which is also assisted by the UN, because I'm not quite sure if we can do this ourselves due to political interference. And the third important aspect of that is we've got to really have a free press that really has to be allowed to uh, investigate anybody and anything and not get harassed. Our record, I think, on uh, looking after journalists and so on is not very good. Uh, we have quite a, a weak uh, journalism score on, on the various indices that exist in terms of protecting journalists. But I think if we do these things right, and you know, these youth protests give me some grounds for optimism. We have a very uh, vibrant youth here who are very keen to ensure that theirs is not a lost decade. And if they join the political process, I think we have a greater chance of success uh, to leverage our strategic location and, and come out of this in a, in, a, in a way that one would like to see for one's children and one's grandchildren. And on that note, Ganesh and Vigneraja, thank you very much. It's been a wonderful chat. Thank you, Luke.